everyone, Dr. James Wetzel here. We're going to talk about astronomy. Uh, we're going to use Rice University's OpenStax Astronomy Textbook, um, which is a free textbook available for anyone to download. And I'm going to lecture alongside uh, with that textbook to help give you a little bit more context about what, this, what the textbook is telling you. So you should watch the video and read the textbook to get the most out of um, what's going on here. So this textbook here, we have um, the textbook panel here on my iPad, Chapter 1. We're going to talk about Chapter 1 here, and we've got the lecture here that I can uh, kind of point things out on the screen for you. So uh, our opening scene here is uh, showing the Earth's rotation. So the Earth revolves around uh, its center, central axis once per day, and that's why we have the day-night cycle. Um, the sky is fixed to the camera here, and you can see Earth rotating. So, chapter one is a brief tour of everything we're going to talk about. Um, starts out uh, talking about the nature of astronomy, then the nature of science, uh, the laws of nature, the numbers that we're going to use in astronomy, um, consequences of light travel time. It turns out the speed of light is constant, and there's some interesting things that result from that. Um, and then we'll give a tour of the universe, discuss the universe at the largest scales, and then the universe at the smallest scales, uh, and then give you kind of a history, a broad history of the universe. So, introduction. Um, the book starts out in this introductory section trying to get you excited about um, the things we're going to cover in the whole textbook. Uh, we are going to um, learn about some magnificent uh, things out there, and things that have no parallel with your regular experience here on Earth. It's going to be wonderful, and I'm really excited about it. During this journey, uh, we're going to learn about uh, Valles Marineris, which is a canyon system so large that it would stretch from DC to LA. This is on uh, the planet Mars. So we're going to start in the solar system um, after we talk about the seasons in the sky. Um, one of the things we touch on are some of the main features of the planets. This is one of the main features of the planets, uh, this giant canyon system. Then we're going to talk about how the surface of a planet tells us a lot about what's going on um, in its history, how it's evolved, things that have happened to it in the past. For example, um, the Chicxulub crater, which uh, uh, killed the dinosaur 65 million years ago. And this gentleman is pointing at the KT boundary line, which is all the uh, deposits from the uh, asteroid when it hit. It ejected a bunch of material up, and as the dust settled, it settled into this thin layer here. So uh, in geologic time, the layers preceding that white line, that's when dinosaurs lived. And then the, after that, there were no, no more dinosaurs uh, anymore. So we're going to learn about craters and what they tell us about the surface. We're going to learn about uh, gravity and uh, orbits and just how that stuff works. For example, this asteroid, which was coming uh, on a collision course with Earth, Earth it uh, missed us and uh, it had its own little moon. If you are on this asteroid, it's small enough, um, we're going to learn that gravity is caused by the mass of an object. There's not enough of an asteroid there. It's very low gravity. You'd be able to throw a baseball and put it into orbit. Um, we need SpaceX to make a rocket, uh, huge, use a huge amount of fuel uh, to get into space to put a satellite into orbit. So um, that's because of Earth's uh, giant size. So we're just going to learn about gravity and orbits. Neutron stars. At the center of this uh, kind of wind nebula, this pulsar wind nebula, is a neutron star. Um, a neutron star is a collapsed star that is so dense, in order to duplicate its interior, we would have to squeeze every human into a single raindrop. So at the end of a star's life, it could end up as a neutron star, as a black hole, as a white dwarf, all different types. We're going to learn about stars after we learn about the solar system. The Pulsar Wind Nebula is at the center of something called the Crab Nebula, and it's actually the remnant of a supernova. So a star exploded, left behind a neutron star at the core of this nebula, but then these wonderful colors and all this material being ejected out into space after the explosion. So we're going to learn about supernova and all the different ways that stars can die. Then we're going to go beyond our own galaxy, and we're going to talk about galaxies in general. For example, galaxy mergers. These galaxies can merge into each other. They go from small galaxies, they merge together into bigger galaxies, and then even big galaxies can merge together to even bigger galaxies. So cannibal galaxies, they're galaxies that 
um, absorb other galaxies nearby. The Milky Way galaxy currently absorbing, uh, absorbing two neighbor, neighboring galaxies. Um, then we get all the way out to the edges of the universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the baby pictures of the universe, this radio echo, it's the faint but unmistakable signal of the creation event for our universe. The CMB uh, is, demonstrates that the, as you go out into space, when you get to the edge, when you look furthest back in time, you see that the universe was a single temperature, a soup, a hot soup, and it's been cooling ever since. That is the evidence for that, um, and we're going to talk a, a lot about that towards the end of the um, uh, course. Okay, so that's section 1.2. Let's talk about section 1.1 now, the nature of astronomy. So it goes into here in detail here that uh, astronomy is the study of objects that lie beyond Earth and the processes by which these objects interact with each other. So astronomy is just we're looking out into the sky, into the universe, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. But it's also an attempt to study the history of the universe. The universe has evolved and it continues to evolve and we want to know those processes. Okay, That's just uh, the general introduction of astronomy there. The nature of science. What is science? It's the ultimate judge. Uh, it, science uses nature as the ultimate judge of whether or not an idea is true. Okay, uh, The scientific method is our way of asking nature to judge an idea. We have an idea, we want to see is it real, is it valid, so we conduct an experiment. It's the best way to understand the truth. If you want to understand something that's happening to you in your life, apply the scientific method. That gives you more power to control the events that are occurring. The scientific method starts with an observation. You see something, you want to explain it. Okay? Then you develop a hypothesis to try to explain the observation that you uh, see. Usually people stop here. For example, lightning strikes. Oh, uh, that scared me. I don't want that to happen. What was the cause? Uh, my room is messy. Oh, that's my hypothesis. My room is a mess, so that's why lightning struck. If I keep my room clean, haha, then lightning won't strike. So that's the, that's the next step. The next step of your hypothesis is to figure out a conclusion, draw a conclusion. Um, you make your observation, you state a hypothesis. If my hypothesis is true, then this should be the consequence. So if my hypothesis is true, that the reason lightning struck was because my room was dirty, all I have to do then is I say, my hypothesis is true. If I keep my room clean, I will never see another lightning strike again. So I can wait, and my idea is true until the lightning strikes. And if lightning strikes again and my room is clean, then um, we have a problem. I have to rethink my theory. Okay, you could imagine trying to link lightning to something you are doing. It would be a tireless effort because lightning striking has nothing to do with anything that you're doing in your life. Okay, but if that was your presumption, you'd have to exclude all of the activities that you're doing. So we let nature test our hypothesis, and allowing nature to do that is the process of science. The most important thing to take away from this chapter is if an idea cannot be tested, it is not scientific. If you cannot conduct an experiment to test an idea, then it cannot affect you because that's what an experiment is. So if something cannot affect you, you cannot affect it, it's not a scientific idea. This is a really important thing, a really important statement um, to make sure you kind of internalize. In order for an idea to be valid, you need to be able to touch it. You need to be able to interact with it, okay? So that's the nature of science, and that's the scientific method. That's the most important thing to take away from section 1.2. Because we're going to have all kinds of crazy things coming up in astronomy, so we want to make sure we're thinking of uh, uh, valid scientific ideas. All right, so the laws of nature. We can extract scientific laws from countless experiments. These laws form the foundation of scientific theories. They're the, sort of the bedrock that allow us to build our infrastructure, our scientific infrastructure. The long story is, or the short story is, that uh, not anything is possible. You need to obey the laws of physics. You can't just dream anything and do that, okay? You can dream anything that can be done, and you could do anything that's possible. Um, so don't let uh, naysayers prevent you from you know, starting a company or 
going and being successful or something, but the better you understand the laws of physics and the laws of nature and economics and science and sociology, the more power you have. So far it seems that the laws of nature that we understand apply not just here, but everywhere in the whole universe and throughout all time. That's a really important thing because that allows us to study things now and here and apply them to uh, the universe as it was in the past and across the universe. Some examples of laws of nature include the law of gravity. No matter what I do, when I let this thing go, it's always going to fall. Uh, we haven't had one time where that didn't work. That's the law of gravity. The Pauli exclusion principle. Why do electrons form the orbitals around the, uh, all the atoms to do all the chemistry, the SPDF, if you remember from high school chemistry? That's because of the Pauli exclusion principle. You cannot have two electrons occupying the same quantum state. That's a fundamental rule. We've never been able to break it. That's a fundamental law. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. We've tried. Uh, we can't do it. Uh, I would like to. I hope we can someday. We're not going to be able to. So that's a, that's a law. Another one we're going to see in, in astronomy is Wien's law. And Wien's law says that, um, Wien's law says that the temperature of a star is related to its color. So when you look at a star and you see a certain color star, you, you automatically know what its temperature is. That's kind of a, a cool uh, law. The job of a scientist and an astronomer is to uncover these laws, and understanding these laws allows us to manipulate the universe. It allows us to, to hack it, to make it do what we want it to do uh, within the framework of these laws. So that's why we do that. That's really good because every electron moving around every chip in this iPhone and those computer screens and the, the computer you're on, every electron is moving through the circuitry obeying the laws of quantum mechanics. And thank goodness they do so I can communicate to you uh, by disrupting uh, just temporarily the electrons, irritating them a little bit to get them to communicate this message to you. So, numbers in astronomy. Um, things in the universe are huge. Planets are huge, you have giant masses. There's a huge number of things out there, right? And they're really far apart, so we need a new set of uh, numbers and units to deal with this because we hate writing zeros over and over and over again unless it's in your bank account when it's not so bad you don't mind writing a lot of zeros but you don't know what that's like probably uh, I don't know what that what that's like I assume it's wonderful okay so we have some shorthand notation for example this number 500 million alright uh, that's a thousand that's a million that's 500 million that's 500 million, okay? This is actually a form of shorthand. We replaced these six zeros with the word million, okay? That's one way we can short numbers, shorten numbers down. In scientific notation, we would write this as 5 times 10 to the 8th, and that just means 5 with 8 zeros after it. Um, and you could write it like this, 5, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's what 5 times 10 to the 8th means. It's just a shorthand notation. Um, we have another problem, so instead of saying that the closest star system, Alpha Centauri, uh, is 40 trillion kilometers away, we might want to use another unit, okay? We could write it as 40 times 10 to the 12th, or 40 trillion kilometers, that's still annoying. That's the closest star. Well, if we're going to talk about things further away than the closest star to us, uh, we're going to have a lot of zeros after this. Andromeda Galaxy is 2.176 this many kilometers away from us. That's the closest galaxy, okay? You can see how this is going to get out of control. So we have a problem. Uh, so, to solve this problem, we come up with a new unit. So we have to think about a flashlight for a second. Imagine taking a flashlight, clicking it on, and the light beam goes and hits the ceiling. It doesn't get there instantly, though, okay? It takes time for the light to go from the flashlight to the ceiling. It turns out that a beam of light travels 186,000 miles per second. 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, or 300,000 kilometers per second. That's very fast. Okay, we're not talking about 886,000 miles per hour, for example. 186,000 miles every second. Okay? Because the speed of light is constant, this is a wonderful feature, we have looked for evidence that it's not. So far, we haven't found any. So the speed of light is constant. Because the speed of light, uh, light is constant, let's use the formula rate times time is distance. So, this rate in this equation is the speed of light. The time, let's take one year, okay? 
then distance is rate times time. The distance then would be the speed of light times one year, rate times time. Okay, Our rate is the speed of light, our time is one year. We're trying to figure out how far light would travel in one year. So we're going to take the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. We're going to multiply it by one year, 500, 25,600 minutes. Okay, That gives you 5.9 trillion miles. So that means if you could ride the light that comes off of a flashlight when you click it on, how far would you be after one year? Okay, If it goes to the ceiling pretty much instantly, how far are you going to travel after one year? Turns out you would travel 5.9 trillion miles or 9.5 trillion kilometers. We have just developed a new unit, and that's called the light year, and it's the distance light travels in one year. Alpha Centauri then is 1.4, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> section 1.4, Alpha Centauri is 40 trillion kilometers away. If one light year is 9.5 trillion kilometers, we can divide the two to see how many times one light year fits in 40 trillion kilometers. We just divide the two. This looks scary. This is just 40.7 times 10 to the 12th divided by 9.5 times 10 to the 12th. You wouldn't do this. You could you could type this into Google like that and, and do it, and it would give you the answer. So um, it can interpret those numbers. Anyway, if you take 40.7 and you divide it by 9.5, because the 10 to the 12 would go away for both of them is the same, 40.7 divided by 9.5 gives you 4.2. So that means... 9.5 trillion kilometers after one year, you travel 9.5 trillion kilometers after the next year, another 9.5, another 9.5. You could do that four times, and that would get you to the closest star system. So it takes 4.2 years uh, for light to travel to the nearest star to us. Okay, that's a long time. Uh, it's about 4.28, I think, so 4.3 light years. So this unit, the light year, abbreviated LY, Extremely important unit. You have to make sure you understand that. There's some consequences to this, okay? So, the closest star is 4.2 light years away. The reason we use this unit is because all of the information we gather from the universe is in the form of light. It comes to us from light. It arrives to us. Uh, think about it. If light traveled instantaneously, we would see the universe and it would be over. <laughs> okay, so light is still being emitted. It's getting to us. It's arriving to us all the time from different parts of the universe. All of the information that we gather about the universe comes in the form of light. Uh, although recently we have LIGO, L-I-G-O, which can uh, listen for gravitational waves, which we'll talk about later. Um, so not all of the information comes to us in the form of light. Some of it comes to us in the form of gravity. Um, but we get the information arriving to us at the speed of light in the form of light. This sets a limit on how quickly we can learn about something when it has happened. Uh, for example, it takes 1.2 seconds for light to reach the moon. So if you have an astronaut on the moon and you want to talk to the moon, and you use radio waves to talk to the moon, light waves, um, they travel at the speed of light. You say something, one, they get it, say something back, one. So there's a two second delay, 1,000, 1,000, two if you're talking to someone on the moon. If you're talking to someone on Mars, depending on the orbit, could be 10 minutes away. Uh, so you'd send a signal to your friends on Mars. You'd have to wait 10 minutes for them to get it. They would talk back to you. So it's about a 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute travel time, uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes and more, to send a signal to Mars and get it back. So uh, that's pretty important. Voyager 1, the furthest spacecraft out there in the universe, uh, that we've the furthest man-made object, it takes 20.6 hours to send a signal to Voyager, and there it's still communicating back to us. That's how we know it has reached interstellar space. Okay, um, the space between the stars. This is uh, really wonderful. That's important. The closest star systems, 4.3 light years away from us. That means the day you walked into high school, you sent a text message to your friend on Alpha Centauri. Four years goes by. The day you graduate high school, they get your message. The day you started college as a freshman, they sent their response to this to you. The day you graduate college, you will get that response. Imagine the last eight years of your life if you're a senior and you're about to graduate. That time is the time it would take to send a signal to the closest star and get it back to give you a sense of scale of the universe, okay? Um, this also means that the further away something is, the older we see it. 
That means the closest star system to us, 4.3 light years away from us. Um, let me go back. Oops. I gotta go back. Okay. Beep, beep, beep. Okay. Uh, sorry, guys. I was doing so well. Okay. This means that the further away something is, the older we see it. Any message we received today was sent 4.3 years ago. So what we, whatever we, what is going on, whatever is going on on Alpha Centauri happened 4.3 years ago. Whatever happened in Andromeda Galaxy, we're seeing it as it was 2.3 million years ago because Andromeda Galaxy is 2.3 million light years from us. That's incredible. That means we don't know what Andromeda looks like right now. We can't see the, the latest stars that have formed or the planets or if there's life on any of them. We don't know. And the same thing, they don't know about us. Anyone on Andromeda has no idea that humans exist because we haven't been around for 2.3 million years. They could see dinosaurs, but they can't see humans. Okay? This means that the deeper we look out into space, the deeper we look back into time, the deeper we see into the past, the younger the universe appears to us. So that's why we make telescopes that can collect a lot of faint light to see as far as we can into the universe, to see deep, deep back in time. And we can see layers like an onion, go back and see the history of the universe and watch it as it evolves, and go all the way back to the edge and we see the afterglow of the Big Bang, where the universe looks like a single temperature all around us. That's an important fact. Make sure you understand that. It's also kind of, you can think of it this way. Episodes of Seinfeld stopped airing uh, in the 90s, and those episodes are traveling out. Alpha Centauri is enjoying them now, uh, but it's only been 20-some years. So uh, the closest stars to us, 20 light years away from us, those are the ones enjoying Seinfeld. Beyond that, our galaxy doesn't even know about humans. It doesn't even know about our, our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. Okay, Half our, our galaxy isn't even aware of humans, isn't aware of Seinfeld, isn't aware of anything. Okay, That's crazy. We're in this tiny little bubble of information which is slowly propagating out into the rest of the galaxy and the rest of the universe and people are gonna hear about us. Okay, all right, 1.6. Let's talk about a tour of the universe then. This is just an overview of the, uh, of the things we're gonna talk about. Um, they start with Earth, but I'm just gonna start uh, with the solar system. So Mercury, that's the planet Mercury, as the closest planet to the sun. And you have Venus. This is what it looks like without the clouds around it. It's normally encapsulated in clouds. There's Earth, our home planet, our organic spaceship that we're riding around. There's Mars with its giant canyon on there, the scar. This is Jupiter with a little bit of an Earth there for scale. Then you have Saturn here with its hexagonal uh, north pole. Here is Uranus with its rings. You didn't know it had rings, did you? There's Neptune with its moon Triton, and you can see the moon, this is actually one, two, three, four images put together, so that's the moon as it orbits around uh, Neptune. And there's that moon close up from the Voyager spacecraft took these pictures. And there's Pluto, the dwarf planet. It's been uh, uh, demoted a little bit just because it doesn't quite meet the criteria for a planet. Then. After we get done talking about the solar system, we're going to start talking about stars. Then we're going to start talking about galaxies, which are collections of stars. This is a, this is a galaxy here, different galaxy. You can see there's some star-forming regions where there's dark clouds. The clouds collapse to form stars. Uh, you can see there's different colors here, blue stars and red stars and red glowing areas, purple glowing areas. Oh, this is a beautiful galaxy. Look at this with this. It's like a uh, very dramatic, has a draping its cape across its face there. Uh, another one, this is a little more elongated. You see its shape is a little bit more kind of stretched out. So we're going to learn all about these things. Look at those deep clouds. How beautiful is this? Another galaxy. So our place in this universe. We are Earth. We are the third stone from the Sun, okay? We are orbiting around a star, a moderately small star, okay? Ordinary star. It's orbiting a supermassive black hole that we have at the center of our galaxy. Every galaxy has one. They're the coolest things. Our galaxy is part of what's called the local group. Um, it's a spiral galaxy. There's different types of galaxies. Um, our galaxy contains half a trillion stars, uh, maybe more. Um, it's part of the, this local group, 
just one of billions of other galaxies that are out there. A billion is a lot. Okay, so just because I say a billion, don't think oh, a billion. A billion is a, that's a lot of, that's a lot, okay? That's a lot of galaxies if you were talking about a billion. In fact, there's trillions of them, okay, in our visible universe. Uh, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So there's our Milky Way galaxy as part of what's called the local group, and it's part of this cluster of galaxies. So if we zoom out to really contextualize this a little bit, the planet Earth, we've got a lot of cities going on, different towns, different sizes, small cities, big cities, little cities, towns, little farms. The universe is made up of countless galaxies it's in the same way. Small galaxies, big galaxies, planets that have no host star, they're just floating around, all sizes. Estimated more than two trillion galaxies uh, within the instruments, our instrument's range of ability to see within our observable universe. Um, there are two galaxies that are being absorbed into our Milky Way right now called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds, and there's a picture of them here um, in this textbook uh, there and there, uh, the little dwarf galaxies. Um, they're part of what's called the local group, uh, the Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, Triangulum galaxy, those are the three nearby galaxies, and then a few dozen little dwarf galaxies speckled up in our uh, midst. That's called a cluster, so our local group of galaxies is a cluster of galaxies, and then groups of clusters become uh, what are known as superclusters. Um, and there's a really cool, this is a nice beautiful picture of Andromeda galaxy, and then we've got a nice picture here of the Fornax cluster, these galaxies are, are gravitationally interacting. They're near each other, relatively speaking. Um, and that's what's called a, a, a galaxy cluster. And then those clusters can group together into superclusters. Um, our supercluster is called the Virgo supercluster. And it's something our cluster is a part of. And this is actually an active area of research. We're trying to figure out the total extent that a galaxy cluster can be. And there, you might hear about the Laniakea supercluster. So it's all kind of, we're trying to figure out how gravitationally related all the galaxies are, and we group them into clusters and superclusters. Okay, so um, there is the universe, the visible universe. This is a map of a million galaxies taken by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, um, and it just kind of shows you that the universe is, uh, broadly speaking, homogeneous and isotropic, which means its galaxies are randomly speckled throughout. There doesn't seem to be any giant areas where they're like this half of the universe isn't missing galaxies they're kind of spread evenly you can see there are a couple of gaps missing here and that's because our own galaxy the plane of it if you think of the milky way galaxy kind of gets in the way of the instrument so there's a couple of dead zones where we can't see okay this is the hubble deep field image this is called the most important image in all of uh, astronomy or in any sort of image this is a grain of sand held at arm's length, part of the sky, where we didn't think there was anything. And Hubble took a picture of it, uh, had hours and hours and hours of exposure time, just stared at empty space for 10 days, received it back, they process, processed it, and this is what they saw. This image is galaxies. Every point of light in this image is a galaxy, except for just a handful. Uh, this and that and this, those are stars in our own galaxy. But every one of these, every little last point of light are entire galaxies at the edge of space. Everywhere we look, we see the same thing. Hubble has done this a few times. So we are not alone uh, in the universe. Uh, maybe humans are. But in terms of our galaxy, in terms of our star, there are so many out there, so many countless stars and planets and galaxies. It's amazing. So let's go to the opposite extreme. Let's talk about the universe of the very small. Even though the universe is very large and filled with galaxies, it is mostly empty, okay? <laughs> There's not a lot going on in here. The smallest constituents of matter, if we imagine what they are, we call them particles. An atom of hydrogen is made of two particles a proton and an electron. In between the galaxies, you would have to search. Imagine a meter stick. Uh, how do I show you what a meter is on my little window here? Okay, a meter, right? You're probably two meters tall or maybe one and a half meters tall. A meter stick, 36 inches, right? <laughs> if you imagine 
one meter by one meter by one meter, an Amazon box that came with a mini fridge, you would have to look around in there. That whole box would only contain one atom in outer space. So one hydrogen atom, one electron, one proton. That's how empty it is. There's almost nothing out there. Compare that with the air that you're breathing. Okay, what did I just breathe in? Feels pretty empty. I don't know, but if you fly around, you can feel the air. So there's something there. We think of air as empty space, but it's not. One cubic centimeter, okay? One cubic centimeter, one little fingernail by fingernail by fingernail, has 10 quintillion atoms in it, okay? Now contrast that with outer space where there's one in a whole cubic meter, okay? That's, that's a lot of a difference. <laughs> so even that, the density of stuff in air, that's a lot of atoms per cubic centimeter, um, we're mostly empty space. These atoms, if you zoom way in on it, actually, the proton, the neutron, the electron that make up all the atoms that you know and love, um, if you were to imagine that the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, which is just one proton, was the size of a pea, okay, half a centimeter or so, then the electrons would orbit that pea at the height of the Eiffel Tower. That's how far apart the electrons are from the nucleus of the atom. That's how much, there's nothing in between them. There's nothing going on in there. That's how far apart these electrons are from the protons. Okay, that gives you just a sense of scale. Um, so that's what this chapter is trying to get you some context uh, for. This is why we say we're mostly made of empty space. Even though I look like I have some skin here, okay, that if I really zoom in on there, it's mostly empty space. Uh, it's kind of amazing. So, just for some context, we have the uh, hydrogen atom, it's one proton and one electron. The helium atom is two protons and, you know, some electrons orbiting around it. And lithium then, so we're going down the periodic table of the elements, one and two and three. What's the one, two, and three refer to? Just the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. Um, of course, there are neutrons that go along with it. So um, we would call this helium-4 because it has four, uh, two protons, which makes it helium, and then two neutrons, which gives a total of four particles in the nucleus. So we call that helium-4. And lithium-6, six, six total particles, three of them are protons. That's what makes it lithium, okay? These are the uh, most abundant elements out in the universe. Hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, iron. Hydrogen. It is the most abundant element in the entire universe. Almost everything is made of hydrogen. <laughs> Not everything is made of hydrogen. The most abundant element is hydrogen, which is made of proton, one proton, one electron. It's the simplest atom, and that's the most common thing you're going to find out there. When enough hydrogen gets together, it collapses into a star, and the star starts burning hydrogen, and the result of that is helium. And then helium can start burning, and that result of that is carbon. And carbon can burn, and the result of that is nitrogen, and oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, and iron. When it gets to the iron, that's when a star explodes, and it spreads this stuff across the universe. So all the uh, calcium in your bones, all the iron in your blood, all the oxygen in the air you breathe, all the neon and the Bud Light signs and the hotel vacancy signs comes from the center of a star. Everything started out as hydrogen, and stars forged all of these elements. Okay, so we're going to talk about that more in detail, but you should be aware when I'm talking about particles and hydrogen and atoms and things, you're, you're thinking of the smallest constituents of uh, matter. Okay, so, so far we've learned that all the phenomena and objects that we have discovered obey, so everything I just talked about, obey only four fundamental forces. Why are there only four? We don't know, but we will discuss those four forces, what they do, the strong, the weak, gravity, and the electromagnetic force. Those four forces govern all of the phenomena we see in the universe, and they're summarized in something called the standard model of particle physics and then general theory of relativity. So um, what we're going to talk about all of those uh, coming up. We don't know why there's only four, but those four govern everything that I've talked about so far. And uh, just keep that in mind when we're talking about the laws of nature. All right, so if we scale the universe then to a calendar year, and that's what this picture is, 365 days, um, the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. 
the Big Bang, let's say, which is what we consider the start of our current universe, or at least the furthest we can see into the past. Um, Big Bang happens at midnight on January 1st. Earth isn't formed until September, nine months into this thing, three quarters of the way into the age of the universe. Earth is four and a half billion years old, uh, it's the same as the sun and all the other planets. They all formed at about the same time. Dinosaurs don't show up until December 25th, until Christmas, and they're dead by December 30th. Only five days out of the history of the universe, dinosaurs roamed Earth. And humans show up the next day. We're pretty close in terms of the span of, of the universe to dinosaurs. In fact, we're closer to uh, T-Rex than T-Rex is to Stegosaurus, for example. Humans show up in the next day on December 31st, but the alphabet isn't created until 11.59 and 50 seconds, just before today on our calendar, okay, just before the present. So humans have only been around uh, doing stuff for a few thousand years, and it's only been a hundred years since we started sending signals out into space. It's only been a hundred years since we learned that there were other galaxies beyond ours. So, think how far we've come in only a hundred years, going from thinking what we see in the sky is our galaxy and is the universe, to realizing that that is just one galaxy out of trillions. All right, so uh, that's all I have for you in Chapter 1. Let me know. Ask some questions below if you have uh, some clarifications or you want to share some videos or links or you want me to share some things. Uh, let me know. Like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And uh, I'll see you uh, for the next uh, chapter. Bye now.